Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for coming. My name is Joe Pichatello. Um, we're here to talk about uh, bike law and um, some issues that come about when you're a cyclist and you intersect abruptly with vehicles and other objects. Um, um, but before we start, we wanted, we wanted to do something a little bit different today. Um, um, we wanted to take like a little bit of a survey. Some of the things we're wondering about as attorneys that represent cyclists is what the perception is of people in the audience um, since COVID. Um, the, you know, the question that keeps coming up in our mind is, are things any different than during COVID, before COVID, um, with regard to vehicles being aggressive and near misses with cars? Um, so we're interested in people's opinion of whether or not things are different now. Um, we, we have some ideas about what may be causing that. And again, we're interested in what, uh, what people are experiencing out there on the roads, if, if you've noticed any difference. Anybody um, care to share this, yeah. gentleman? Right. Yeah. Anybody else have that same experience? Yeah, we um, th there have been some theories that have been put forth about that um, people being um, cooped up and frustrated and um, getting in a vehicle and, and going fast like that. Um, and we're we're wondering if things have settled down since then. If you, your voice up a little bit. Yes. Um, definitely, I'd say no. And I think that, to be honest, I'm going to say COVID is not over, obviously. I'm going to right. But I think that some people are getting a little too excited, which I absolutely hate, um, about, oh, we're getting back to norm now with crowds, more cars on the road, and right. people doing stupid things. Like, for example, I'm looking at August. Uh -huh. And there's all this traffic. Why? Because two moms are fighting and blocking everybody else from getting in. Okay? Interesting. Stupid stuff like that. People on the bridge, crowding, of the press rights, and this word, you know, it's like that herd mentality. Right, right. Is back. I think it's in bigger force than before. Yeah. Yeah. Also, um, I don't know if anybody's noticed or realized there's been a, a, a drastic influx of delivery vehicles, right? And we, uh, unfortunately, in my office, see a lot of cases with um, Uber, Lyft, and various other uh, rideshare uh, companies that um, are out on the road more and, and, and depending on what level Uber you get, some go faster than others. And we're seeing, we think that some of the problems we're seeing may be attributable to um, increase in delivery, food and, and people. Um, but th the one thing that bothers us is that there's definitely, from our standpoint, there's definitely not a decrease in the amount of incidents out there, unfortunately. Um, cyclists and just auto accidents. So, um, and, and before we go to the next slide, yeah. did, did you want to say, were you, did you want to say something earlier? Oh, no, I just recently moved to Philadelphia. Overall, it hasn't been that bad, but I've had like four or five incidents where people have been aggressively driving. The, sometimes the funniest, but it's kind of like um, right. from the point of view, like you're not getting anything done. They'll get behind you on like a one-way street. But there's nowhere they can go around. They'll start honking or trying to pass. Right. And where, where are you from originally? Where did um, you move? I'm from Missouri. Just okay. Moved from St. Louis. Okay. Well, welcome to Philadelphia. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Overall, yeah, somebody just stopped up at our booth upstairs and from another state and uh, I think it was I think it was New Hampshire and they told us that they were really impressed by what's available in Philadelphia and the way they were being treated on the roads. It was uh, impressive what the infrastructure looked like here. That was a 
pleasant story to hear. I've never heard that before. Did you have something else? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yep. Yep. We'll get into that a little bit later um, about how to handle those situations. Um, Marissa, you want to? Some... Yeah. So I'm Marissa Perron, and I'm just going to do the next two slides. Which uh, this is uh, this is just kind of unfortunately leading with the bad news, which is um, there was a really good NPR um, podcast just in September. On the left hand side, traffic deaths are at a 20 year high, um, so that's not good. Um, and if you look, and that's that's big picture of the country, but if you look specifically on the right hand side at Philadelphia. The graph of Philadelphia, that's 2019, 2020, 21, and only six months in 2022. So um, as of June of 2022, we had 63 traffic fatalities. So it's definitely on the rise in Philadelphia. The lower graph is equally sobering, showing how Philadelphia compares to um, comparable cities. So that's a big seven. Uh, traffic deaths per 100,000 residents. Um, you know there are other troubling things, but we won't we won't give you all the bad news. But there 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 are good things. There are good things happening. Um, um, many may say it's not enough, but we'll focus on some good things. Um, so Vision Zero. Many of you probably know the concept to reduce traffic deaths to zero by a certain time period, 2030, I believe yep, it is. Yep. Um, in Philadelphia, the graph on the left, this is showing Philadelphia's budget for Vision Zero, which has been underfunded for most of these years. Um, but the good news is in fiscal year 23, they have approved, the budget has been approved for $23 million, which is a big deal because if Hopefully the people in city council and the mayor will make good decisions on how to use the money with more traffic calming devices, the barriers. Um, but um, one of the low hanging fruits is really to lower the speed limits and to have better signage and to do other, like I said, traffic calming um, mechanisms or devices. The other thing that is a good, a good um, takeaway post pandemic is that during the middle of the pandemic, uh, speed cameras, automated speed cameras were installed on Roosevelt Boulevard. Roosevelt Boulevard being a terrible high injury corridor in, in the region. Um, and uh, professors that have been studying this, as well as PennDOT, um, have made various statements that in the uh, course of installing these speed cameras, they estimate that there have been eight fewer, six to eight fewer deaths on the boulevard. So that's good news. You know, still too many people, you know, are dying on Roosevelt Boulevard. But I will also leave you with one super bright um, story, which is the city of Hoboken has actually reported that they have had zero traffic deaths for the past four years. Um, and this NPR story, talking about the bad news of the traffic fatalities, uh, their, their offset to that was a whole kind of expose about this, uh, the efforts of the folks in Hoboken, which many of, their, um, many of their successes they attribute to small incremental change, most specifically of um, lowering speed limits. Um, and again, with the basic things of traffic calming. Um, so uh, another thing that's not on the slide, but I think it's worth um, sharing, the Bicycle Coalition of Philadelphia is amazing. They work tirelessly. They, along with uh, Families for Safe Streets and Vision Zero, have been advocating that the Philadelphia Police Department change the name of their traffic division from Philadelphia accident investigation, change that accident word to crash. 
Um, and while some people think or complain that that seems like, um, you know, minutia of, of words, the concept is that, um, is that an accident is unpreventable, but a crash is something you can prevent. So if we change the word to a crash, we, we recognize that these traffic fatalities and crashes are preventable. They're, they're not inevitable. If, if, you have our, if we have our top policy people assuming, oh, our people are just gonna be dying on the roads, it's, it's, it's something that's gonna happen, we can't do anything about it, that changes the perception and, and public policy yeah. that follows. So now the focus will be more on preventing these crashes. So yeah. we think that's a good thing. Yeah, back here. Just, just real quick, if I can mention on that topic, uh, sure. there's a good book on that. You've seen your book, There Are No Accidents. I don't know if you've read yes. it. Yes, yeah, yep. that's great. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And just to echo what, um, sorry, um, uh, oh, God. just to echo what Marissa is saying, um, this, this concept of just changing the word is not just changing the word. Um, as, as an attorney, something, a theme that we see, and sometimes it's kind of subtle, other times not, but a theme that we see when we're trying to negotiate a case um, is the other side suggesting that, look, accidents happen. Accidents happen. And we firmly believe accidents don't happen. It's if you accept them like that, that they just happen, it's almost relieving a responsibility. And somebody pointed out to me not too long ago, when's, you know, what, do, what accidents don't just happen. What, when, a, when, a, when a plane crashes, why do we call it a plane crash? Does anybody say, oh, it was just an accident? Something went no, wrong. No, something went wrong. Something was right. not done properly. You know, there was a backup that should have been followed that wasn't. And it's the same thing when you crash on a bike or you crash in a car. It didn't just happen, it happened because somebody wasn't, either somebody was not doing what they were supposed to be doing, they were being inattentive, or it really has little to do with the actual drivers of the vehicle, it has to do with the infrastructure of where you're riding your bike, right? So we have to start thinking about changing the infrastructure of cities, as Philadelphia is attempting to do right now, so. And Brand, you had a... I was just curious, I think it was Yeah, yes, exactly. That's, yeah, that's, that's what I was trying to convey just yeah. now, that oh. they are changing their yeah, they just did. They accident just did. division to, they haven't released apparently their formal name, but they are replacing, and because of the lobbying by advocacy yeah. groups, yeah. Yep. from accident to I crash. I didn't know that part was formal. I knew that they said that they were going to start using the language, but I didn't know that they had, they had committed to renaming it. They yeah. have, yep. apparently. Oh, yep. yeah. So that, yeah. that's a win. It's you know, news. it's small, yeah, it's but it's a win. Yeah. It's something. Pretty major win. Actually. Yeah, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yep. Yep. So the next. Do you, uh, do you want? Do you, oh, no, okay. Okay. So the, the the next section of of the talk that we'd like to highlight are, um, you know, common incidents that we see day in day out, sometimes multiple per day. Uh, distracted drivers is really sort of at the top, um, of, of the list of what causes a lot of crashes. Um, during incidents, we'll go over some examples. Um, right hook and left hook is what we refer to as a certain type of crash that takes place when the cyclist is uh, operating their bike down the road and a car just from their left hand side takes a right in front of them or into them. Um, the right hook and the opposite is when you're operating your bike down the road and the vehicle coming in the opposite direction in plain view makes a left hand turn in front of you, the left hook. And then the one that we experience every day, um, hopefully not crashing, but vehicles um, driving really super close to you, what, you know, being buzzed is something that we become unfortunately all too used to as a cyclist. So um, distracted, this is, this is an example of a, obviously a, dist you don't have to play, mm -hmm. this is a distracted driver. This is a case that we um, represented uh, um, the person on the bike that you're about to see. If you just concentrate on the image, it's a, it's a, it's a video. And in this case, you'll see the cyclist enter from the right hand side of the screen to the, to the left. Um, and the, the, the vehicle 
uh, you'll see come up behind her. And in this case, um, obviously the vehicle didn't realize we had video of it that we found, but they claimed that the bike just shot out in front of them and they didn't do anything wrong. But uh, t this, is, this is what you're up against, um, unfortunately. A distracted driver, an example. There we go. Yep. It happens quick, so. Yeah. Uh, well, where did you find the video? Um, I actually, I can't take credit. I won't take credit for me actually finding it. Um, a friend of the cyclist, when she told them where this happened, said, oh my God, uh, I know the people that have a company that has surveillance of everybody that pulls in and they were kind enough to give it to our office and or we would not have had that which leads to the issue of you know cameras and we'll we'll talk about that in a bit but uh, sometimes uh, videos come in pretty handy um, another common uh, scenario that takes place is uh, what we call dooring um, there are um, Many, if you ride in the city, not everybody has to ride in the city, but in the city, there are situations often where you don't really have a choice. You have to ride close to vehicles, but what we encourage people to do as much as they can is to leave a buffer zone when you're passing vehicles on the right. Assume any door is going to open. Um, and if you have to, pull out into the lane and take the lane. You're, in, you're entitled to do that. You should never be in this door zone because they will, they will um, open their door on you. Now there's, um, there's, a, there's a, a, a movement that's being illustrated in the lower right hand corner. Any, anybody familiar with the Dutch reach, right? Many of you are. It's a really, if for, for the, those of you that are not, it's a really nifty uh, technique that's even being taught to driver ed students in, the, in, in Pennsylvania now. Uh, when, you're, when you're operating a motor vehicle and you're the driver, you should never, you're taught never open the door with the hand that's close to the door. Um, the Dutch reach is a method that encourages people to reach with their right. When you do that, it forces your body to look a little bit to your left you can't throw the door open quickly using your right hand, and it forces you to look and visualize a little bit closer to the side. And if people would do that, it's, as you could see, it causes a uh, decrease in the amount of dooring incidents. So if you're a driver, never open with your left hand. Use your right hand. That's a Dutch reach. So before we go to the next one, out of curiosity, anybody in the room experienced mm -hmm. dooring? Have, yeah. You've been doored? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so one thing that um, that we try to, and it's not always something you could do, but we try to encourage people when you do find yourself uh, encountering a door that's opened, um, what should you never do? Exactly. It's hard to, it's almost like a reflex, but never swerve out of the way of the door um, people are killed that way, they go out into traffic. So you wanna do everything you can to hit that door if you have to, you know. Um, it's very, unless you of course see and you have enough time. Yes. You mean you mean uh, motor vehicles that don't want to give you space, or other cyclists, or? No, I'm talking about motor vehicles. Ah. Well, uh, like, okay, so they see one thing. I'm looking for is light, or if I see a person in the vehicle. So if I see a person in the vehicle, or if I see lights in the vehicle, you already know that's that's a possibility that the door can potentially come through. Right. Yeah, there are all you're right. There's all types of telltale signs to so that, that you know a door is going to open. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, sometimes you have to pick your poison, right? You're either going to ride next to the, the cars that are going to open their doors or you take the lane, as you really should pull out. It's, it's better to have a car blow their horn at you and get upset than to find yourself uh, being in a crash with a door or trying to swerve to avoid it. You just, um, you have to make a choice, right? And if you can, you just have to pull far enough to the left. Um, this is, I would say, the most common. Um, unfortunately, it's probably equally as common with the next type we'll talk about, but this right hook happens incessantly. Um, and oftentimes, if you could believe this, the vehicle and the insurance company for the vehicle takes the position that um, the bike hit the car, therefore it's the biker's fault. Or I've heard this one, the biker was passing vehicles on the right and you're not allowed to pass on the right. So it's the, bi <laughs> the biker's vehicle. A biker's uh, fault, there's um, just, there's a plethora of reasons why it's the cyclist's fault in this situation. Um, and I'll, I'll show you a video of it, but, but, before, but before we do, you know, part of this lecture is not just to point out common crashes, it's to, let's, let's really try to think about how to avoid them, right? So whenever a vehicle, you have to go back, um, whenever a vehicle is overtaking you, um, passing you on the left, and they don't have their turn signal on, what, what should you do? Should you assume they're not gonna turn? Every vehicle that passes you, you need to understand, is likely to turn. And it's likely that they did not see you, and even if they did see you, cognitively it didn't register that you would keep going, and even if you did keep going, of course, you would yield to them. So you have to assume that they're going to turn in front of you. That's the number one rule. And uh, we'll give you an example of this horrible situation that occurs in the next. <sighs> yeah, we could. Um... Excuse me a second. Yeah. As obviously an untrained legal person, my mind sees the difference between bicyclists stop at a red light driver in the right lane, pulls up alongside of them and just... To looks, your left, the, the vehicle's to your left? Yeah, vehicle's yeah. to the left of the bike. Just as the car arrives at the intersection, or right before the car arrives at the intersection, the light turns green. The cyclist is stopped, okay? One thing, that's one scenario. The other scenario is the cyclist and the car are sitting at the green light. I mean, it's red light, red light. And, and the yeah. light turns green. How does the law read in the second scenario where they're both at the red light and the light turns green? Yeah. Who has the right of way to go through the light first? Well, the the uh, you're talking. Well, the law is very clear. It's just like you're in an automobile. If there's a vehicle to your right, let's imagine a two-lane road, and there's two vehicles at the green light. Do, can you ever conceive of a scenario where the vehicle to the left has the right, the light, the right to cut in front of you? Any vehicle going straight has the right of way. So when you're pulling out from a green light, from a red light, the light turns green. The vehicle that's going straight will always have the right of way. So Even this. Even if it's the travel lane and the shoulder of the road. Absolutely. You're, if you're going straight, no vehicle is permitted to make a right-hand turn and impede your line of travel, even if you're on the, the side of the road. Yeah. It's like you're a pedestrian crossing a road. You have to yield to a pedestrian. Uh, one trick that I noticed that Just keep your, if you could just your voice up a little bit louder. One, especially for the stop scenario, um, I will pull far out in, like pretty much the king's head on the floor or somewhere now, if I see pedestrians, I will yield to the pedestrian but let them pass in front of me. I noticed that when I pull out like as close to the street as possible, but not in the street, it either allows them to turn right behind me or they have to. Yeah, wait. yeah, no, that's a good, that's a, that's a good technique. Um, another technique that I won't overtly advocate is that you go before the light turns green because it's safer, right? Uh, vehicles get very upset with cyclists that run red lights, but actually it's safer to run the red light, you know, of course, if you're looking, um, 
instead of waiting for the vehicle to turn into you. So that's why a lot, and actually part of, I'll get to you one second, part of, um, part of thinking about how the infrastructure of a city has to change um, also entails light systems at intersections where if you ever are at an intersection as a cyclist and there's a vehicle next to you, there is a separate scheme of lighting where in some cities, the light turns just for the cyclist. There's actually a, a cycling light. You get a green light so that you could proceed and cars should not be starting at the same time as you. Because it's a recipe for a disaster, as you're pointing out, when you both have a green light, who gets to go first? So that's part of changing the infrastructure where you have a different light scheme to protect you from that. Let's, let's do scenario three. A car is stopped at a red light and there's a group of cyclists, probably three cars deep on the shoulder of the road or, or just off to the right lane. Light turns green telling me the driver, and I'm not suggesting I believe anything, mm -hmm. but you're saying that the driver that's in the right lane needs to wait until all those cyclists go through the green light. No, 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 if the, if, the, if, the, if the vehicle is proceeding straight, both you and the vehicle could proceed at the same time. It's only when the vehicle's gonna make a right-hand turn. Okay, if, the, if, the, if the car wants to turn right and there's 15 cyclists that are three car deep, the car legally must wait until all the cyclists go before they can turn right. Yes, you know why? Um, think of the logic involved when you're going in one direction and vehicles are coming in the opposite direction and you want to make a left-hand turn across traffic. Is it fair that you have to sit there and wait until traffic clears, like 50 cars? Yeah, you got to wait until all the cars go by because they have the right of way. Right? So you wait. And it's the same thing with the cyclist. Yes, the no, vehicle. I, I, I understand what you're saying. I guess I'm trying to get to, is there a difference in the law between an actual travel lane and to the right of the travel lane? In other words, if those 15 cyclists had taken the lane, mm -hmm. they were not off to the right hand side, they were in the lane, obviously the car needs to stop behind all of them. Mm -hmm. Have to yeah, there's no different. They cleared the yeah. going straight before they could make a right Yeah, in, in, in Pennsylvania, your travel lane as a cyclist also includes the side of the road that's on the other side of the fog line, the curb. It, you're, you're, that is your, that's like your lane. That's your lane of travel, and you have the right to proceed straight there. So. As a driver, I would wait for all those cyclists, but I know many drivers wouldn't. Yeah, that's a different. Yeah, that's a different issue. Yeah, but you do have the right. You do have the right to proceed. You had a question. Yeah, I was. I oh yeah, I'm sorry. Traffic signaling. There's not a bicycle signaling signal, but there's an LPI. Does Philadelphia have LPIs, and if so, are they just pedestrians, or can cyclists go through on them? Well, um, cyclists, unfortunately, um, we have a case in the office right now where um, the cyclist um, went and they did not have a cycling green light. But did they have an LPI? They did not. Oh, all right. Yeah. So it's just yeah. Like yeah. What, what does what's LPI the law stand in for? Philadelphia, if there's a leading pedestrian ah, indicator, can right, bicyclists right. go through on it or is it just for pedestrians? It's just for pedestrians. Are we, gonna, yeah. are we working to get that changed? It's a good question. It's something that should be I addressed. Think, yes. I think yeah. so. So if you're riding your bike across, say, with a line of pedestrians, say a car happens to hit you, maybe it's a couple of they just came to hit you. I mean, I guess at that point, the car would probably be running a red light if that was the case. Well, sometimes cars are going through that area and not running a red light. They're turning, they're turning, and we have that situation where um, a pedestrian is permitted to cross, and cyclists, um, we have a situation where a bike path goes where the, where the pedestrians go across the street, and all of the, pedestri all of the cyclists technically are supposed to dismount their bike and walk as pedestrians across the walkway with the pedestrians. And if they don't, they're at fault, and we're fighting a case like that right now. Wow. All right. This is a situation. Yes. 
Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. So that uh, this happens. This unfortunately happens a lot. Um, it's um, if we were to play that over again, and you're and you're actually thinking this is a potential crash, you you could actually avoid this crash if you know it's coming. Um, and this is why we tell people every vehicle that is passing you, if you think about it and there is a driveway, there is a parking lot, you do have to be prepared whenever a car passes you and slows down that the reason it's slowing down, they typically slow down at, you know, before they turn, they will turn into you. And we assume, go ahead. Are you aware of the current case in Washington, D.C. where this is exactly what happened? No. What, what, tell the us about State Department employee was bicycling in the bike lane. She got right hooked like that mm -hmm. by a truck uh -huh. turning into the driveway and killed. Mm -hmm. Her husband, and now with the help of Trek's federal support arm, uh -huh. is organizing a ride November 19th from there to the Capitol to try to get more bicycle funding into an infrastructure bill. So if anybody's going to be in D.C., November 19. Oh, that's great to know. Ride. Yeah, unfortunately, this this type of crash happens uh, okay. every day in Philadelphia. Every day. I, I call that the spidey sense when you know it's about to happen. Like bicycles mm. have well, just get the spidey sense. Yeah. Um, so you were, you were saying, I guess, who's at fault? Because something very similar happened to me, where I was hit, but I was hit by the front wheel of a truck, and then my bike went into the side of the truck, and an officer told me. Because the dent is in the side of the truck, I was liable mm -hmm. to that's pay for this thing. truck. Wait, were you wearing a helmet? <laughs> <laughs> that's that's <laughs> why. Not only did I have a helmet, I yeah. had a bright yellow vest yeah. on. Yeah. So yeah. I, I thought ice yeah. vest is from an ice pack, yeah. so I, I'm usually not that sick. But I, I was told that I was at fault. Yeah. If I tried to go through his insurance that I would end up paying for his car's damage. Yeah. Even though, like, God, this was absurd. Crazy. This is one of the reasons you should have counsel in a situation yeah, like I mean, that. No, that's, I, I yeah, that's clearly, yeah, yes. so um, I may have told some of you earlier today that I spoke to, I, I have a case that we're working on right, right now that's just infuriating. Uh, a woman um, in the Lehigh Valley was proceeding down a country road in a truck, a pickup truck, um, came by and smashed into the back of, into her, um, back of her head, split her skull open and fractured her spine and uh, her shoulder. And um, she was unconscious at the scene and the police came and uh, they brought her to the hospital. And the police officer, um, put in the police report that it was her fault because she obviously, obviously turned into the vehicle, the truck that had the right of way going straight. If she would have stayed where she was on the side of the road, it would have been impossible for him to hit her. So she obviously turned into him and all the damage was on the side of the vehicle knocked the mirror off and it was a lot of body, a lot of damage to the side of the vehicle. Um, this is like patently false. If, if there is another, there is another explanation other than the bike turned left into a vehicle, it is possible that the vehicle was traveling too close to the cyclist. Um, but the police officer took it upon himself to put in the report it was her fault because she pulled in front of him. And because the police officer did that, the case didn't settle, and now it's in litigation getting ready for trial. And yes, yeah, what is today? Saturday. Saturday. Um, Thursday, we had the deposition of the driver of the truck who um, did nothing wrong. He, to my surprise, was 100% honest. He never even told the police officer that the cyclist pulled to his left, to her left, into him. He actually testified that he was going down the road um, and he remembers seeing the cyclist right before the crash 
And I said, where, where were they? Was there a, a fog line? And he said, yeah. I said, what side of the fog line? Not that she had to be on the right-hand side, but he said she was on the right-hand side of the fog line. That's the last thing I remember. And the next thing I know, I see her in my passenger side window, smashing against the window. It looked like her head hit my mirror. And this is the driver telling the story of how the crash took place. Yet on the police report, it said something completely different. It said she pulled into him. Now, um, that case is about to settle very quickly when the, you know, when the gentleman testified to this. But, but the point is, when vehicles pass you, if they, it doesn't, if you really pulled out to your left in front of a vehicle, chances are they would hit you from behind and there would be no damage to the side of the vehicle if, if you did pull over. Even if you are hit from behind, that doesn't mean that you pulled into their lane of travel. We represent many people who are on the side of the road. Once again, you don't have to be to the right of the fog line who are hit square from behind. That does not mean you did something wrong, right? But unfortunately, um, we see cyclists that are cited for that scenario. Clearly, you were not at fault. And to, yeah, and that's, that's where all the damage comes yeah, to the side of the, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I don't think these people are thinking on a physics level. Yeah, yeah. Have to keep okay. Um, next, uh, left hook. This is, uh, this, I, it's, it's unbelievable, but it's not. Vehicles going in the opposite direction uh, clearly could see the cyclists. Why? would this happen? Why would a vehicle going in the opposite direction make a left-hand turn in front of a cyclist? And let's take a look at it and then we'll have a little discussion about it. Let's take a look at the, and, and, and before you start it, I'm telling you, I'm telling you a vehicle is going to make a left-hand turn in front of this cyclist. Pretend that you're the cyclist. This is you riding. This is your perspective from your bike. Ask yourself if you could potentially avoid this crash, knowing that it's going to happen. Okay. If, and once again, this is not Vic, this is not blaming the cyclist. We have to devise as cyclist strategies to minimize the chances of being hit. If we're constantly thinking, if we see a car slow down, that's going in the opposite direction, once again, even if it doesn't have its turn signals on, even though you have the right of way to proceed, it might be a pragmatic approach to slow down or put your brakes on because um, it doesn't matter who's right or wrong, you're gonna end up in my office, right? You had, go ahead, you had a- Yeah, but it seemed like he wasn't making a, he was doing a slant across the road rather than an actual, you know, get there, make a left turn. So that's even harder to anticipate. Maybe impossible to avoid, yeah. right? Absolutely, I agree with you. But even though that's the case, we have to, as cyclists, I know it's a horrible uh, yeah. thought that we have to anticipate vehicles are gonna turn in front of us, but um, it makes sense too. Um, the four foot rule, um, it's great, but um, it's only as good as uh, motorists respect it. Um, people um, are still being buzzed in Pennsylvania, even though there's a four foot rule. Um, people are being, like the last case that I was telling you, where the here, it's common phenomenon, mirrors hitting cyclists, um, and they'll blame the cyclists for, um, for being too far in the roadway, but the, the law is they have to get four foot. We're actually, the only encouraging thing about this is we're starting to see on, on police investigation reports and soon to be crash reports um, that they're starting to s give citations to motorists for, I've only seen it a couple times, violating the four foot rule because they um, side, you know, they buzzed a little bit too close and they caused the crash. Like, 
there's no there's way for you to get. Yeah. There's not four feet. Yeah. Right. Yeah, there's not yeah. four feet. If I moved as far as I could to the right, you can't get past me in there. Get out of the way. Like, it's not possible here. Right, no, right. Was there somebody else to head? Okay. Um, next section that my that Marissa tells me is really boring. I don't think it's boring. This I think this I think is the most exciting part of uh, of cycling. Um, how do we protect ourselves financially? Um, so we want to talk a little bit about insurance. Um, there are two populations of people out there as cyclists. There's the population that do own vehicles, and there's the population that don't. For the people that don't have motor vehicles, you're in an unfortunate category. You're in an unfortunate population because automobile insurance is exceedingly important. It's our friend in bike crashes because it is what protects cyclists if you're ever in a crash. And that's what we want to try to impart to you today. Um, it's very important to have car insurance. And the, the, the reason is your insurance policy on your motor vehicle, and we, go through, we have this conversation every day with, with new clients, um, we ask them who their automobile insurance company is, and they say, no, 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 I was involved in a bike crash. And they don't realize your car insurance is what protects you if you're in a bike crash because a bike crash is auto-related, right? There's a vehicle involved. If there's a vehicle involved, it implicates an insurance policy. Even if you weren't on your bike and you were a pedestrian and you were hit, that would be an auto-related crash, right? You're a pedestrian involved with, a, with an automobile, so it implicates your insurance. Your car insurance in Pennsylvania has to at least pay the first $5,000 of your medical bills, which could be eaten up like that if you're in a crash and they call in a trauma alert. It kicks in all kinds of strange laws that allow the hospital to bill you at a rate that you could have like a thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollar bill from one visit to the ER if it's a trauma, if it's a trauma call. So yeah, at least have the first five thousand that your car pays for. Who pays for the next five thousand dollars or the or the bills above and beyond that? Does anybody know? Joe Biden. What's that? <laughs> Joe Biden. Joe Biden, yes, <laughs> Joe Biden does. Um, you, your personal health insurance kicks in then. Your personal health insurance can't pay for your bills if you're in a crash. If you have an automobile, your automobile has to pay the first 5,000, okay? And then it's your personal. And if you don't have personal, it's the other insurance company then. Were you, did you have yeah, so say you have like health insurance and your deductibles, I don't know, 500, 2,000, mm -hmm. whatever. And then, and, and then your insurance kicks in, right? And if you've already, if you've already been impacted by your deductible, you, you might still have co-pays. All of the bills that you have that accumulate, like your out-of-pocket expenses, after the first $5,000 is paid, you don't have to pay anything for those doctor visits. You're, that's paid in full by your insurance. Whatever is allowed to be paid, the doctor cannot ask for a penny more they have to by law only accept your car insurance. Once you go to your personal health insurance, then they are allowed to charge at a different rate, but whatever you don't get paid for that you have to pay out of your pocket, that's part of your case. That's what we get you compensated for, so you keep track, that's called an out of pocket. So your deductible, whatever it happens to be, that's part of your case, so when we settle your case, that's part of the money we get back for you. You no, know, your your car insurance doesn't pay the deductible. Your car, it's whatever bills come in. The first five thousand dollars of bills that are presented to your insurance comp to your auto, they have to pay. And then you would pay your deductible. And your then you would jump to your personal health insurance, and your personal health insurance would be res whatever your contract is. Some people have a really big deductible of thousands of dollars. Other people just pay a copay. Whatever the whatever your other insurance pays. Whatever you have to pay out of pocket, that's part of your case. You would think so, right? You would think so. They are ultimately. They are ultimately. Your insurance company would pay the bill, but then charge, like, 
Yeah, so what, so mo most people, most people think, well, that doesn't make sense. Why is your own insurance company paying for the bills if the other side is at fault? There's a public policy reason behind that, and it, it could get a little bit involved, but let me just sum it up by saying this. When, when, you're in a, when you're in a crash and you need medical treatment and you need it badly, what the legislature did not want to happen is for you to have to say, I need this treatment really badly. Can you pay for my bills on the other side? If the other side says, well, wait a second, it wasn't our fault. We shouldn't have to pay the bills. Then there's a dispute and there's a delay in treatment. So what our legislature said is, you know what? Right after a crash, that's, the, that's not the point in time where you should be deciding who pays bills because that would delay treatment. The way we're gonna work in Pennsylvania is when you're in a crash, your bill should be paid immediately. And the way we do that is your own insurance company pays and then your personal health insurance pays. And when the case is settled, when all this money comes in, your insurance company, your personal health insurance company who paid out $100,000 for your treatment, they're allowed to come, they're, they're allowed to knock on my door as your attorney and say, hey, we know this person's about to settle a case. We've paid $100,000 of bills. We think we're entitled to be paid back. That's called subrogation. It's like a technical term for it. So they come back to us and they say, we're entitled to be paid back. And we say, you know what? You're right. Thanks for paying the bills in the meantime while we fought this battle out, but now the other side is gonna settle with us. When they settle with us, and we take this into consideration before we settle a case, we don't settle a case unless we know there's enough money to pay off all the, what we call the lien holders, the medical liens. So when we're settling a case, we take into consideration that our client's own insurance company paid $100,000 in medical bills. They have a right of subrogation, i.e. they have a right to be paid back. So when we're negotiating a settlement with an insurance company, we communicate and they know, hey, we've got a big subrogation lien here. My client's never gonna see penny one until you pay at least X hundred thousand dollars or X thousand dollars. So that's part of your case. So we get that money and then we pay back your insurance company. So really, where's that money coming from? It's coming from the other side. They are paying it eventually, but it takes a while before they do. Well, what if there's no other side? Like you crash because of construction debris or something. Is your car insurance company still involved or does it, does it just go to your health insurance company? Yeah, good question. Your, your, your car insurance would only be involved if another car is involved. In that situation, the construction company would be involved, but you would go to your own personal health insurance and then when we settle the case, we would pay back your own health insurance. Uh, sorry for so many questions. I could that's okay, that's that. okay. Yeah. We'll move along, but you know, it's good you have questions because these are yeah. important scenarios that evolve. So this is a, maybe more of a theoretical. Uh, anyway, so say there is an incident where there's a driver and a cyclist involved, but the cause of the crash was related to have you seen cases like that where maybe the person that designed the intersection or something or whatever governing authority was involved had been actually gone to trial and had to pay? Is that something that you've seen? No. Okay. I didn't think no, so. but not to just blow it off and say no that, that flippantly. Um, there are cases that we've handled where a vehicle crashes and the reason it crashes is because we claim that there's a defective design in the roadway. And if you do it properly, you could make a claim against the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. They're extremely difficult cases, um, but you could, in effect, you're arguing the infrastructure of the, of the roadway. Yeah, of course, but, third yeah. Yeah, especially that sounds like a Yeah, you could, they're very difficult now with, um, I, I could envision situations with the infrastructure changing in favor of cyclists, that there could be something defective, some infrastructure problem that theoretically you could bring a, a, a cause of action against the city or the people that put in the devices. But, um, but there's not been any that I'm aware of so far. Say there had been a, say a third party private citizen, they parked their vehicle at an intersection on a parking zone that obstructed the line of sight that contributed yes. to a crash. Have you seen those cases? 
Yes, yes. They, they are cases where you could make a recovery if the vehicle really had something to do with causing the crash. So but let me we give to, you, we're, yeah, we have like less than 10 minutes, ah. and this is the fun part of the insurance. This is the stuff you okay. need to listen let me, to. Let me, just, let me just cut to the chase uh, on insurance. If you own a motor vehicle, you need to make sure that you have, to the, ex to the extent that you could afford it, as much under insurance and uninsurance as you could afford. You should have at least $300,000 of coverage of under insurance and uninsurance. And in Pennsylvania, whenever you take out your policy for your motor vehicle, let's say you want a policy of $100,000 to protect you, we call that liability insurance, right? The minimum amount you could have is 15,000. That's the least expensive. But if you have a little bit more protection, you have 100,000 or 300,000, whatever it is that you pick, by law, the insurance company has to give you the same amount of underinsurance and uninsurance. So if you have a $100,000 policy, you automatically have $100,000 of underinsurance unless you sign a document that says, I know I'm supposed to have the same amount of underinsurance, but I'm gonna reject it. I'm gonna give it up. Even though I know I'm supposed to get it, I'm gonna give it up because I know it's gonna reduce my premium a little bit. Many, many people sign that form and they don't even realize it. So you have to be careful and check your policy tonight to make sure you have underinsurance and uninsurance and if you're not sure, I tell people you're welcome to contact my office. It's not like something I'm going to charge you for. We'd be happy to look at it and see if you have it. But you really have to have it as a cyclist. OK. Um, does anybody have questions on the insurance situation here? Go ahead. Yeah, the system that you're describing, is it normal? Uh, this Pennsylvania system, is, is that typical for other states? Like, is it normal Um, all states are different, but there is a common theme, and the common theme uh, across the United States is to give people protection and automatically give them some type of underinsurance and uninsurance when they get their policies. I don't know what it is in Virginia, but it's definitely available in every state that I'm aware of. But it's something you should still check. Um, when a crash does occur, um, there are various aspects of representing a cyclist that you're entitled to. Um, what we do is we have your property damage replaced. Whatever the value of your bike is, we contact a bike shop. We have them inspect it. They do a report that indicates whether or not the bike has been compromised, even though you don't see a crack in the frame. Um, I think only on one, on one occasion has a bike shop gotten back to me and said, no, I won't sign that report. What almost every bike shop does sign a report is it says, this bike is involved in a crash. We cannot guarantee the structural integrity of the unit. It should be replaced. And insurance companies pay for, the, pay for replacing the cost of the bike. And it's something, not something we charge for. We get whatever the money is, it comes in, goes right to the client. The only little caveat there, it's not as rosy as I paint it to be, the insurance companies will say, wait a second, we believe that that bike costs $5,000 or $3,000, but it's three years old. We're gonna knock off X amount of dollars because we have to depreciate it because it wasn't worth that when, the, when it was hit and ruined by our client, by our insured. So they usually offer a little bit less than what it's really valued at. And then that's part of the negotiation to get them up. But um, we could get that paid for. Your medical bills are a next component that an attorney representing you will process your bills for you. Any bills that come in, make sure they go to the insurance company and they're all paid for. And some people, if you look at your insurance policy, I tell you, look and make sure you have under insurance and uninsurance. You also could have something called um, wage loss insurance. A lot of people probably have it and don't even realize it. If you're out of work as a result of a crash, you could be compensated for your lost wages. Of course, you need to provide documentation of that, but uh, you could get that also. Uh, you know, uh, what, quickly though, because well, we gotta just get the one more part. Go ahead. I'll ask the, I'll, I'll ask 
Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, for the remember I said there's two populations of people, people that have vehicles and people that don't. If you don't have a vehicle, you could still purchase insurance to protect you if you're involved in a crash. And that insurance, will, and I've had clients that have had this, that insurance will pay for your, your, some of your medical bills, whatever you purchase, the amount, and also your property damage. So your bike could be replaced, your clothing. So there are companies out there, just Google it and you'll find, these are some of them. Um, I forget which, uh, Markle. Markle's Markle is one we had recently where they stepped in. My, my client said, I have bike insurance and they paid they paid for all his property damage. It was pretty, pretty cool because the insurance company on the other side did not, they didn't have insurance on the other side, so they were protected. Okay. Um, quickly, after a crash, besides getting yourself out of the roadway into a safe spot, if you can, even though you believe and know you're not hurt, please take a photograph of the license plate, the vehicle, um, because on a regular basis every month, there's always a couple clients that we have that come in and say, I didn't take any of the information from the driver because I felt okay. I didn't, I didn't think I was hurt. And then I woke up the next day and they're sore and they're going to a hospital and they're going to a doctor and they never got the information of the other vehicle. So definitely if you're ever involved in a crash, if you could get their name and number and case, you know, if they don't, if they don't give it to you, take a photograph of their license plate because we have ways of finding out who is driving that car if we have their license plate. Um, um, also, very helpful to call the police, even though you think the police may not be needed, the police are definitely needed because remember I told you that most important thing is to have under insurance and uninsurance on your policy. You cannot make a claim for uninsurance. Uninsurance is if the vehicle that hits you takes off, it's like a hit and run, or they don't have insurance on the other side, if you have uninsurance, that protects you because the other person is uninsured and you could settle your case with your own insurance company. But you can't do that unless you prove to the, your own insurance company that there really was an accident or there was a crash. They'll ask for proof that you really were involved in a crash. And as a matter of fact, if you look at your policy closely, it'll say we're not going to pay any claims for any uninsurance or underinsurance unless you produce a police report or some other document that shows that you reported it to a governmental entity. So you should have a police report, even if you have to go to the police station afterwards and fill out a self-police report where you just say the person took off, you fill it out, make sure you have that because it's needed. Um, one of the last things, and I'm sorry you don't have more time to talk about this is really cool invention that this gentleman has here. Um, cameras and lights. We've had many cases. It's very helpful to have documentation of what took place um, in a crash. Um, but I'll warn you of this also. We have, um, we have had cases where we've had problems because we had documentation of what took place. <laughs> Not because the cyclist did anything wrong. I have a, a, a case um, where the cyclist was, it was a, a, a right hook. Clearly the client did not do anything wrong, but the people deciding the case almost decided the case against him, not because he did something wrong, my client, but because he was crazy for riding his bike in a narrow spot. He was in a city and he was riding and he had a GoPro and it displayed like several seconds before the crash, it displayed him moving between parked vehicles and vehicles that were backed up at a light. And he was proceeding, you know, maybe he was going 15, 20 miles per hour in a small space. And they thought he was asking for it because we showed video of him being right hooked. So you have to be careful. Sometimes the video comes back to haunt you. And real quickly, I would be remiss if I didn't know, this gentleman here has a really nifty um, cool. dash cam. Yeah, you want to just cam. for a minute say what this yeah. is. So not everybody could afford to get a, a, a GoPro or, or some other device like this. But yeah. uh, check, check this out. This is kind of interesting. Uh, instead of buying a GoPro, just use the $1,000 camera you have in your pocket. I have these mounts. You can buy them on Amazon. Uh, they tilt up so you can record your rides with your phone, whichever direction you want. 
uh, works as good as a GoPro. You get HD video. If it's on iPhone, it's even as stable as a GoPro. Uh, so you can get for like fifteen or twenty dollars online. Um, yeah, you just mount your phone to your handlebar. And how does this how how does this interface with? Uh, can you explain this? Yeah. So if you're in Pittsburgh and I'm trying to find new cities, uh, in Pittsburgh you can report uh, hazards to 311. So whether it's a pothole or a car to bike lane or a detour sign that's missing, just like with one tap in the app, you can say like send it to the city and it automatically routes it to the department that can fix it. So the city of Pittsburgh is already using this to like fix potholes and bike lanes because who reports it, right? Who gets off their bike and takes a photo of the thing and then no one's reporting, right? What but the app it's called dash cam for your bike. If you come see me, I have a few free mounts that I can give if you promise to use the app. Um, and then I have a bunch of flyers I can give if you want the two one reporting in your city. So how much battery does it use at low? Uh, very little. Okay. So uh, an average commute uses about 5% of your battery. That's great. Any uh, gentlemen back here? So I don't think you talked about this, but what recourse do we have in, in what he just mentioned, which is if there's infrastructure, if, if there's some some hazard in the road that the city failed to maintain a pothole yeah. or a, a yeah. You you do you do have recourse, but we, it gets tricky because they have to have notice of it. Um, as long as you can prove that they had notice of this defect in the roadway. Um, they are responsible, the city could be responsible for that. Anything else? Quick side note. Yeah. You said about crashes recording. If you're a walker, a bike rider, or a car driver, and you come upon a crash, it already happened, you didn't see it. If you can stop, get out, and just go click, 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 do the 360, because there might be a witness somewhere, and it'll show up, and you can go to them later and say, did you see this? This person that's been whacked, isn't cognitive. Mm -hmm. And so they need help. angels like you to step up after the fact and help. Yeah, that's a great point. Thank that's you. That's a great boss. point. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, Stay safe out there. Thank you, guys. Thank you.